All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the 2023 MMID Symposium on TB and HIV. Welcome to everyone joining us in person and online. This is the first MMID Symposium since in person since 2018, so it's great to see all your faces here and also online. Before we begin today's festivities, I think we have some slides coming up, but um, I want to recognize that we have the privilege of gathering on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands, the Anishinaabe, Cree, OD Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and the present. A land acknowledgement is only a small part of the work that must be done, and we dedicate ourselves to cultivating strong partnerships with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today, we are excited to hear from a di diverse lineup of experts and leaders in the field of HIV and tuberculosis. And the main goal of this symposium is to achieve a dynamic and interactive opportunity to dive deep into the topic and encourage critical thinking and collaboration in between disciplines. So in addition to a series of engaging talks, this comes in the form of several Q&A periods and a career panel with our speakers, uh, as well as a student poster session, which brings me to a few housekeeping items. So we're excited to offer this symposium in hybrid in-person and virtual format. And we please ask that our virtual attendees ensure that their microphones remain off during the talks. Our technology chair, Monica, over here, give a little clap for Monica, <laughs> will be monitoring the virtual question forum during the QA and panel periods. And next, we ask that the audience do hold their questions for the dedicated Q&A periods. Um, there will be one Q&A period this morning for doctors Plurd and Orr, uh, one after lunch, and then one after the coffee break. And also everyone, but especially students, please keep in mind that the career panel is an opportunity um, for you to ask questions beyond the lectures and gain insight into the diverse career paths of our speakers. And please save these questions up. Titus and Irwin are the marketing uh, and finance chairs of the planning committee and will be moderating our morning session. And so without further ado, I will invite Titus forward to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Morgan. So uh, my name is Titus, and I'll be introducing our first speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Pierre Plod. Dr. Plod is a graduate of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, and he completed his residency in internal medicine and infectious diseases at the University of Manitoba, and a fellowship in tropical medicine at the University of Toronto. He's currently a medical officer at the, of health for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, WRHA, and professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences and Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the University of Manitoba. He is also medical director at the Travel Health and Tropical Medicine Services, the LD Sexuality and Harm reduction team within the WRHA public health program. And also the medical director of the WRHA integrated tuberculosis services. Dr. Plod also leads interprofessional health care, student electives to Haiti in collaboration with University Lumiere in Port Haut Prince. In 2010, he received the Dr. Jack Armstrong Humanitarian Award from Doctors Manitoba, and in 2021, the Moira, Morka, the Moira Walker Memorial Award for International Service from Infection Prevention and Control Canada for his work in Haiti. Please join me as I welcome Dr. Plod to the podium. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation to present 
me get my slides up here. So this is going to be the um, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of that stuff on the bottom. Okay. This is going to be the, the cold, hard facts, maybe more boring part of this part of the morning, and Dr. Pamor will follow me with a much more interesting material that will, I hope, be um, framed very well by the numbers, uh, because those, uh, those are important uh, as well. So what I um, am looking at, and by the way, I have no relevant which I did, but I have no relevant conflicts of interest uh, to declare. And uh, thank you for, for that uh, acknowledgement. Uh, I won't go over that again, except to say that these broken treaties that we talk about are a direct cause of what we're dealing with today in terms of HIV and TB. Uh, and so, these are just going to be numbers right now, but behind these numbers are very real broken and shattered uh, lives and uh, as a result of, of broken treaties, I must say. So I set out some questions. I interpreted the request I got. I hope these are the questions that the organizers were hoping I would answer. I tried to, to because it's hard to find some of this data worldwide and Canada-wide and even provincially, but how much TB and HIV do we have in Manitoba? That, that we can find. But how much co-infection, how much do the two occur together, is not so easily determined as one might think, because the, the, the databases um, for collecting the information are both, are unfortunately uh, somewhat uh, separate databases. Um, and where might be we heading with HIV, TB, and co-infection in Manitoba from what we know? So there's two ways to look at this. How much HIV testing is being done in persons with tuberculosis, active tuberculosis disease, and what's the HIV positivity rate in people with TB? Or how much TB infection testing is happening in persons already diagnosed with HIV, and what's the rate of TB infection or TB disease in persons who have HIV? So I'm looking at both angles. Um, so this is going back now, stepping back and going to 20,000 uh, feet altitude, uh, look at uh, globally, um, what do we know about TB and HIV? Well, we know that they're both among the top 20 um, killers when it comes to infectious diseases worldwide. Um, and, and not just infectious diseases, because road injury and heart disease is on this list. So of all the, the, the killer conditions and, and diseases worldwide, um, tuberculosis is number 13 and HIV is number 19. So that's why we're talking about uh, HIV and, and uh, TB today. Looking at... Um, Tuberculosis and uh, HIV TB co infection, though, over the years, it would appear that globally the curve is kind of flat, but it's flat and slightly decreasing. Whether you're looking at uh, millions of, of, of cases, so incident cases, or uh, rates per 100,000 population, there is a slow decline that has been happening. If you look carefully, though, you see this little flattening, maybe even increase here. That coincides, obviously, with the year 2020 and following with the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. So there's been a, a, a small resurgence, or at least small on this scale, uh, not small in overall numbers of uh, TB. Remember, on this side, it's a log scale. So this little increase here is, is fairly significant, even more so. Deaths related to TB, so TB deaths worldwide, have increased for the first time and increased significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is worldwide data. Um, we actually have local data, and we were one of the few provinces that saw this. Um, but not only us, there were some observations in BC uh, and Ontario of this similar phenomenon that were seen worldwide. But the uh, number of uh, TB deaths um, over the pandemic uh, years, which in this case are 2020, 2021, and 2022, significantly increased in Manitoba. So we're looking now at um, case fatality rates. 
Um, so deaths uh, uh, due to TB versus the total number of TB cases diagnosed in a given year. Um, there was a peak in 2016 uh, related to several northern outbreaks uh, that uh, year, even though the, the peak was seen mostly with uh, TB cases in Winnipeg, interestingly enough, rather than in rural or northern Manitoba. But by and large, over the years, we were seeing roughly overall in Manitoba somewhere between uh, 3 to 5 percent of deaths due to TB in persons with TB. Now, how does that compare? The average across Canada is three and a half to four and a half percent. So this is normal. This is not good to see people with TB dying, but a rate of three and a half to four and a half percent uh, deaths in people with TB is the baseline, is what you kind of expect to see due to disseminated TB, TB meningitis, or severe forms of, of tuberculosis. But as you can see during the pandemic, the rate doubled and even tripled provincially, and even more so uh, in Winnipeg, got as high as almost 12%, horrendously high. Uh, this is, again, low denominator, but translated to a very high case fatality rate for one year in cases that were rural and northern RHAs, excluding uh, First Nations Inuit Health Branch. But even in First Nations Inuit Health Branch, a significant increase in deaths. So throughout Manitoba in 2021, uh, TB deaths were increasing across the province, both in foreign-born persons with tuberculosis and in Canadian-born First Nations person suffering tuberculosis. And when actually we looked a little bit closer at um, the foreign-born versus um, First Nations, TB and First Nations people, we saw that TB and First Nations people represented about 44% of all TB during the pandemic years and about 49% of all TB cases were in foreign-born individuals during the pandemic years, with the death uh, rate in foreign-born persons being 30% uh, and proportionately quite lower than the death rate of 57% in First Nations persons. So obviously, a, uh, a disproportionate higher rate of death in First Nations persons, which I'm sure people in this audience won't be surprised uh, to see that, uh, that, uh, that phenomenon. So if you look at um, World Health Organization maps regarding tuberculosis, Canada appears to be one of those countries that has very little TB, rates that are consistently less than 10 per 100,000 population, along with Western Europe and uh, Australasia and the US and the Caribbean. Uh, we appear to have uh, very little TB, but obviously Canada is, is a huge country and coloring our map with one single color with TB doesn't make any sense. Um, and I'll show you the Canadian map in a moment. But it is true that <coughs> uh, since the um, early uh, 20th century, where TB rates in Canada overall were astronomical in the 40 per to 100 per 100,000, what's a high rate? Worldwide, any country with a rate of TB over 30 per 100,000 is considered a high incidence country. Uh, you can see that that rate continued to increase and be incredibly high until about the 1960s, when, uh, in, you know, the 1950s even, when rates started to come down. But by the 1960s and even 70s, the rate was quite low, having reached 10 per 100,000 in the 1980s, and ever since the 1980s, our rates have remained low, uh, even um, down to roughly 5 per 100,000. So I want to look at this flattened part of the curve to kind of take a look at, is it really flat or are we still going down? And it, you can see that we are still, our rate is still uh, decreasing, or was, until about the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, where we reached about five per 100,000 and seemed to have plateaued, never really going below 4.5 and actually rebounding again to roughly where we sit now around five per 100,000 or 4.9, I think, is where we sit most recently per 100,000. Now, what are these red lines? These red lines are targets that were set at different times by the World Health Organization or the UN uh, and, and, uh, and Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada joined in to try and reach targets that were set in 1997, 2006, 
and once again in 2015, targets to try and help us uh, work at reaching um, the ultimate sort of target is that by 2050, we would have less than one per um, one million, actually, cases. So um, this is an intermediate target by 2035 of less than one per 100,000, which is uh, down here, this line. And then less than one per million is right above zero down here. Um, and so by 2050, that's our target for Canada. And by 2035, this is our target. These were designed to get, get us there by different dates, 2015, 2020, et cetera. And we just have not done that. As you can see, our curve has flattened. So is that the best we're gonna be able to do in Canada? Is it even possible to do any better? Well, our neighbor south of us suggests that it is probably possible to do better. In 2006, now the scale is different here, but in 2006, the rate in the United States, this rate, which isn't what's shown here, but this rate or this number translated to a rate of about five per 100,000, essentially down from 10 per 100,000 in the 1990s to five per 100,000 in 2006, which is where Canada was in 2006 at about five. We had reached, like the US, five per 100,000. And this is where we differ from the US. We stayed flat at five per 100,000, where the US has managed to continue to decrease its rate, which is now down to about 2.5 per 100,000, well on their way to the pre-elimination target of less than one by 2035, which is this line here that I drew in. The bottom line is the ultimate elimination line of one per million by 2050. But it looks like the US are well on their way to reaching one per 100,000 by 2035, which is gonna be way out there somewhere, but they're well on their way. So why is it that Canada's curve has uh, flattened while the US uh, has, has seemingly gone down? Well, it, it's basically shown in this um, graph from the public health, produced by the Public Health Agency of Canada, that our ongoing high, uh, relative uh, high rate and plateauing of our curve overall in Canada, because the rate of TB in Canadian-born non-First Nations person has basically reached elimination. It is at less than one per 100,000, um, as reached pre-elimination at least. Whereas, as you can see in northern Inuit peoples, rates continue to be massively high, over 100 per 100,000. And then this bottom part of the curve expanded down here. We still see that rates in First Nations persons, whether on reserve or off reserve, are over 20 to 30 per 100,000. Remember, the definition of a high incidence country is 30 per 100,000. Well, that's where we sit in many northern First Nations communities, and we sit well above that 30 per 100,000 in even further northern Inuit uh, communities. And so the rates of TB in those northern communities are as high as rates were in Canada overall way back in the 1920s and 1930s. So, uh, not surprisingly, Manitoba situates itself as one of the highest incidence uh, rates of TB in uh, Canada, uh, averaging between 10 to 15 per 100,000 overall in the province. North of the 53rd, we're probably, well, not probably, we are over 30 uh, per 100,000, and even higher rates in Nunavut uh, north of us and rates in southern Manitoba a little bit lower uh, in a range of around 10 uh, per 100,000. But still, um, high, the highest rates of TB in the provinces in Canada are found in Saskatchewan uh, and uh, Manitoba. We hover currently somewhere between 12 to 13 per 100,000 in 2022-2023. And as this um, graph shows, our curve is flat in Manitoba. It's flat at a high level at around, again, 12 to 13 per 100,000 versus the national average in Canada of about five per 100,000, which is still high compared to the US. But you can see that in Manitoba, every three months, every quarter, we see roughly 40 to 50 cases, which adds to almost 200 cases per year and has been pretty steady. This decrease at the beginning of the pandemic was probably artificial due to people 
not accessing care as easily during the initial part of the pandemic, but the numbers rebounded again, and by 2022, we see again close to 200 cases uh, reported in that uh, calendar year. And on 2023, uh, we're projecting based on our first quarter data about 189 cases. So a very flat curve in Manitoba maintained at 12 to 13 per 100,000. But behind that is a bit of good news because we're seeing a shift in TB in Manitoba in the um, demographic, the ethnicity demographic, an increase, a gradual increase relatively speaking, of TB in foreign-born populations, which used to represent about 35 to 40% of TB in our province, is now almost 50% of TB, about 45 to 50% of TB in our province. So the proportion of TB in foreign-born persons is increasing over time, and the proportion of TB in First Nations persons is decreasing from 60% to now 45 to 50% in the province. So TB in, the, in First Nations and foreign-born peoples is both equivalent now uh, in our province um, over time. And this is partly shown here in terms of since the outbreaks of uh, TB in northern Manitoba, this data is exclusive to northern Manitoba First Nations communities from 2016 to 2022. You can see, and I overlaid, I tried to overlay these curves so that the, 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 um, the, the value of, of 10 um, counts, 10 cases kind of uh, across the board in these overlaid curves matches. You can see since the outbreaks of TB in 2016, a gradual decrease, this was about a 10 to 15% decrease of TB in Northern First Nations communities with literally no change to the social determinants of health. No improvement in housing, no addressing water, like with, without any of that, with as best we could, still limited access to healthcare, but as best we could, uh, engaging communities and doing more, uh, recognizing more people with coughs and doing more testing of sputum, getting PCR technology, access to PCR technology in northern sputum specimens and diagnosing TB earlier as a result and getting people on treatment and helping people complete their treatment, plus good close household contact investigations and finding the close contacts, convincing them to get tested for latent uh, TB, so-called latent TB infection, and then offering treatment to everybody who we think has TB infection before they get sick with TB and offering them uh, treatment and, and encouraging them to complete their treatment. All that good hard work resulted in 10 to 15% decrease um, per year, um, essentially showing me that uh, as per our recent World TB Day theme in March, uh, yes, in theory, we can end TB, uh, at least in First Nations communities. Alberta has virtually done it. They've practically eliminated TB in Northern First Nations community. Um, and so we know, and Alberta's rates of TB in First Nations community used to be just as high as ours about two decades ago. So we know it can be done. And we saw that it was on its way. Uh, with 10 to 15 percent declines every year. So what happened uh, here, uh, what happened, of course, as you can see by the, the years, is the pandemic. And so we had a 65 percent resurgence. We're back to where we were back in 2015, not quite as bad as 2016, but multiple outbreaks occurred again in northern communities. And what happened during the pandemic that might have related to this um, phenomenon? Well, we stopped testing sputums for TB. People who were coughing and spitting up stuff were getting lots of nasopharyngeal swabs, but the, the, the healthcare providers and patients were just not keen to go beyond that. So the, the sputum testing rate went down um, for TB during the pandemic, whereas we were focusing mostly on COVID. And then we were telling people with coughs, unless you're really, really sick, stay home. Right? Don't come to the nursing station or don't go to emergency. Uh, stay home until you can't possibly stay home or you have red flag signs like uh, uncontrollable fever and, and, and coughing up blood or something like that. Well, if you wait that long with TB, and how do you know if you've got TB or COVID? You really didn't or people didn't. When you, if you wait that long for TB, 
the likelihood of dying from TB and of the treatment not working is much higher. Hence, probably one of the main reasons why we saw such an increased death rate due to TB, as I showed you on a slide earlier. And so the rebound in TB was predictable and inevitable as we weren't testing as many people. The, these cases that occurred in 2022 were probably delayed presentations of persons with TB. And also we completely stopped treating TB infection. Those close household contacts being assessed and treated for latent uh, TB infection, that was stopped during the pandemic, virtually stopped. And so the reservoir of people with TB infection was growing at the same time. And hence, no surprise, in 2022, a significant resurgence of TB in, in northern communities. The good news is that seems to have leveled off and may even be on the decrease in 2023 already. So looking in more detail at TB in Manitoba, we see two different patterns. The one that I say call the Winnipeg pattern, which is mostly TB in foreign-born persons, three quarters of all TB, and the other quarter in Canadian-born persons, most of that TB seen in people who I, I self-identify as uh, Indigenous. Um, so I just want to point that out. But what I also want to show on this slide, since we're talking about HIV today, is what we know about HIV status in persons who are diagnosed with TB in this province. So in Winnipeg, we know that over years, it's been a pretty stable rate of around 2 to 5%, under 5% generally. Um, over uh, the, the years, TB, HIV co-infection has been uh, low. We also know that we're testing, we're doing a good job testing for HIV. Well over 95% of people are tested. The missing and not done data is always very low. And this 10 will go down as time progresses. Um, the HIV status is eventually uh, recorded into the database. And so I expect that this 11% will go down to less than 5%. And so we do consistently see over 95% of people diagnosed with TB in this province have an HIV test and a result. And most of them, the vast majority, are HIV negative, except we saw in 2022 for the first time over 5%. Is this a trend? Obviously, the numbers are low, and it's too early to make any conclusions uh, on this, but we just have to keep a very close eye um, on this. Uh, so far in 2023 in Winnipeg, the HIV rate is uh, with uh, low numbers of TB, um, 30 to 40 cases so far this year, um, the HIV rate is 3%. So again, I don't know if HIV TB co-infection is increasing in, in Winnipeg or not yet. In the rest of Manitoba, so rural and northern Manitoba, including rural uh, non-First Nations and rural First Nations communities and TB, we, we see that the three, it's the exact opposite of Winnipeg. Three quarters of TB in northern uh, rural Manitoba is in Canadian-born Indigenous individuals and about 20% in foreign-born persons. And the HIV positivity rate there has remained quite low only one to two, and then again, three cases. Is this trend an increasing trend? Hard to say. We obviously have to keep a close eye on this, but generally speaking, 95% plus of people with TB being tested for HIV and less than, well under 5% um, having uh, co-infection with HIV. Um, as you'll learn maybe later today, HIV-TB co-infection is a bad combination. The diseases um, synergistically uh, make each other worse, and so it's much more difficult to, to manage TB, for example, in somebody who has uh, HIV infection and vice versa. The two don't go well together, and the outcomes and the severity of TB disease in people with HIV <coughs> tends to be worse. So uh, looking at the rest of Canada, the data is more sparse, but it looks like, and this is data from the Canadian TB standards, relatively recently uh, published uh, a year ago, showing that um, the number of, uh, the testing rate for HIV is only about 50%, 50% right here. So 
we're not doing nationally a great, as good a job in, as we are in Manitoba, where our testing rate is over 95%. It looks like at least what's reported to the Public Health Agency of Canada, I don't know how accurate the reporting is, we only know the HIV status of about 50% of persons diagnosed with TB across Canada. The good news is the HIV, in those who are tested, the HIV positivity rate is well under 5%. So as it has been historically in, in Manitoba, is under 5%. Um, this is the same sort of data, looking at it a little bit, uh, graphed a little bit differently. But again, uh, of um, all people who have um, TB, the um, total uh, number of, of, of persons who were uh, tested for um, HIV is roughly around 50%, uh, and the HIV positivity is quite uh, low and uh, decreasing over time, interestingly enough, as you can see uh, from way going back to 2001, where HIV positivity was around 15%. Um, it's been decreasing ever since and is currently running around 3.5% in the years uh, 2017 to 2020. So again, low rates of HIV infection detected in people who are tested with HIV who have TB. An even more uh, recent update to this, a webinar that was presented by the Public Health Agency of Canada around World TB Day this March, so this is even more up to date as of March, and we, we have 2021 data now, shows that in both 2020 and 2021, the uh, rate of testing is still around 50%. It's not great, uh, but the rate of HIV positivity may have increased a bit uh, from, um, it was high, 10% or above up to 2016, and then um, only 2 to 3% following that. And in the last uh, first two pandemic years, 2020, 2021, reached around 5%. Um, so again, is this an increasing trend? Only, only time will, will tell. So skipping back now to HIV specifically, um, there has also been a decreasing trend of HIV worldwide, uh, according, again, to, to data. This is data from UNAIDS. Uh, but having said that, there's still a lot of TB, uh, HIV worldwide, um, as you can see just from this uh, 2021 data, with almost 40 million uh, cases of, of, TB world, of HIV worldwide. I'm not going to mix up HIV and TB. Uh, HIV cases we're not going to look at. So what about the picture in Canada? Well, in Canada, like TB, Manitoba situates itself as one of the highest HIV prevalence provinces in the country. These are contests you don't want to win, right? And Manitoba is kind of winning in spades, sadly, with both uh, TB and HIV. In fact, this is an old uh, data. This is from 2020, where we were second to Saskatchewan and close to, to Quebec. And uh, everything changed during the pandemic, whereas Saskatchewan's rate is still around 15 per 100,000. You'll see that Manitoba's rate has doubled, if not tripled now. So where we were at around 7 on this curve, our own data showed somewhere between 7 and uh, 9 to 10, depending on male and female per 100,000. Women have now overtaken men for the first time in 2022, and look at our rate. Our rate is approaching 20 per uh, 100,000. Having been nationally reported as seven per 100,000, we're now at triple that, seeing this massive increase starting in 2021 into 2022, and shows no sign of abating in 2023. We, are, uh, we saw roughly 100 cases of TB, new diagnosis of TB per year, prior to 2020. In 2021, we saw 164 cases. In 2022, we saw 262. And the projected total for 2023, based on what we've seen in the first quarter, is 345. So this is showing no signs of, of abating. Um, and uh, you'll ask the question, what is fueling this uh, outbreak? I'll get to that uh, in a moment. But where this is occurring is mostly in uh, rural northern health region, this purple curve here, and the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. 
that are seeing uh, somewhere around um, 10 to 15, maybe closer to 15 or higher um, HIV per 100,000. And there's even now a cluster, a small outbreak and cluster uh, that is not showing up on this curve yet in Prairie Mountain Health. So we, re we are seeing more and more outbreaks um, related to uh, HIV now in, in the recent uh, two years through the pandemic that the uh, provincial HIV program has in their recent report very well demonstrated to us that these outbreaks are occurring mostly in women uh, through heterosexual transmission of TB who are injecting substances, most often it turns out to be crystal meth, who are indigenous. The most vulnerable person in our province at this point in time is an indigenous woman who is self-medicating um, with substances to help her uh, deal with the daily hell that she has to live through. And she is not acquiring HIV through the use of shared needles primarily, at least anecdotally, it looks like most of the HIV transmission that's occurring right now, that leading to this increase, is not injection substance use transmitted, but is sexually transmitted. Why do we say that? How do we know that? We don't know with 100% certainty, but hepatitis C, which also spreads efficiently through sharing of needles, rates of which are also high among people who use substances are not going up. Hepatitis C rates are not going up. At the same time that HIV rates are skyrocketing, hepatitis C is poorly transmissible sexually. HIV transmits better um, than, HIV, than, than hepatitis C sexually. So we think this is mostly crystal meth induced hypersexual behaviors that have been well described in the literature that are fueling this current HIV uh, outbreak, mostly again in young, uh, young being less than 35, indigenous uh, women using substances. Not exclusively, but they appear to be the, the most vulnerable and the fastest growing demographic uh, uh, in this data. So now let's look at global um, data regarding HIV TB co-infections. And I'll end with, with sort of a few slides showing the best information we have on uh, TB HIV co-infections. So this is a global map showing the estimated HIV prevalence in new and relapse, so active TB disease, TB cases, how much HIV is seen. And you can see Canada is, is showing um, a uh, percentage that's low, less than 5%. And we know that already from the data that I've already shown you. I just wanna give you a heads up though, to sh not only show you that the rates are much higher in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, uh, uh, in Russia, um, but that the Ukraine is one of the countries which has uh, very high rates of uh, TB, HIV, co-infection, and we are uh, welcoming, as we should, many uh, Ukrainians on the run uh, as, as refugees or in refugee-like situations. We're not labeling them as refugees, but we are um, uh, welcoming um, many Ukrainians into Canada who will likely, many of them, be potentially bringing both TB and or HIV into Canada, requiring us to recognize uh, those diagnoses, hopefully sooner rather than later, so that people can receive the care that they need. So a heads up uh, on, on that regarding uh, HIV TB co-infection rates are expected to increase in, in Canada with the influx of, of refugees from very high incidence uh, countries. The um, UNAIDS database, I don't know how accurate this database is. I'm not familiar with it, how the data gets into this database. Uh, they don't look at rates here. They just look at incident TB cases and people, in this case, living with HIV. So how much TB is diagnosed in people living with HIV? And Canada's around the middle of the pack in terms of I can barely see this, this number, but I think it's 60 to... Um, 
60 to 370 reported cases. So these are just numerators. This is just numerator data. I don't know what to make of that. The USA is a little bit higher than Canada, but remember their population is 10 times ours. So there's not a 10 times difference here in numbers between Canada and the US, suggesting that Canada's rate is probably much higher than the rate in the US of incident uh, TB in persons living with HIV. But it's really hard to interpret this data, except that it shows that the number of, of uh, TB cases in people with HIV seem to be much higher in Sub-Saharan Africa, in parts of Asia, Central and South America. But again, I find it hard to interpret this data where it situates Canada with lower incident cases. Similarly, TB-related deaths among people living with HIV would seem to be low, positioning Canada in the 9 to 79 reported deaths category, exactly the same as the US. But again, our rate should be 10 times less than the US if we were uh, comparing ourselves with, with the US. So this suggests that our rate of TB death in persons living with HIV is much higher than it is in the US. And then finally, um, thank you to Dr. Zuma Rueda for this uh, information that is hot off the press. I just received this on Friday. I asked Zuma, uh, does the Manitoba HIV program collect data uh, on people with HIV, uh, how much TB infection is found uh, in, in those individuals? And she said yes and, and pulled some of that data out uh, for me, which basically shows that around um, 50 to 60, you know, half to, to two thirds of people over the last uh, 2020, 2021 at least, uh, persons with uh, HIV referred to the Manitoba HIV program were tested for TB infection, primarily with the blood tests, the interferon gamma release assay. And of those um, who were tested, um, roughly um, 10 to 15 percent, 12 percent, 14 percent, sorry, yeah. No, it's the next slide. I'm sorry, so ignore that. Uh, roughly um, 10 to 12 percent or so, so you're combining the indeterminate and positive here, 10 to, to 12 percent um, were uh, positive for TB infection or had evidence of TB infection. The IGRA test being somewhat more specific and, and sensitive than the tuberculin skin test, one uses this to assume that these are true latent or so-called latent TB infections. So what we know from our local data is of the half to two-thirds of persons with HIV who were tested for TB infection, not sick from their TB yet, roughly 10% of them, or one out of 10, uh, have evidence of a TB infection that should be treated in terms of preventing future um, activation of that TB disease and getting into trouble with a TB disease. And how many people with HIV get into trouble or have TB disease? And you can see they, they can have serious TB disease, disseminated or extrapulmonary TB. It's roughly one to 2% over the last few years. So not very many, but one to 2% of persons um, with HIV have been diagnosed with active TB disease at entry into HIV care, so when they, when they, they were diagnosed uh, with, uh, with their HIV. So not inconsequential, but not huge numbers so far. What um, appears from the data that I've shown you is we do know now that in Manitoba, the, the proportion of TB in foreign-born persons versus indigenous persons is roughly 50-50, 45%, 45% in this case. Um, uh, but with the proportion of TB in foreign-born persons gradually growing over time, like it's reached 75% in Winnipeg, it will likely in the next few years reach 80 to 85%, which is what is seen in um, Edmonton, for example, where their TB is re oh, well over 95% now seen in foreign-born uh, persons. And that's the, the direction we're heading in. HIV co-infection in persons diagnosed with active TB disease has averaged 
around 2.2 percent between 2016 and 2021, with a range of 0.5 to 3.2, never higher than that, and it increased to 5.1 percent in 2022, the first time it was over 5 percent. So is this a trend? This is something we will have to watch carefully, but if you see what I showed earlier, the HIV outbreaks that are out of control, some of those occurring in northern high incidence communities with TB, northern high TB incidence communities, it's only a matter of time that HIV and TB will happen in the same uh, individuals. Um, but for now, active TB disease in persons with HIV infection remains relatively low, 1 to 2 percent. Uh, but we know that TB infection is about 10 times that about 10%. And those persons, if they're not diagnosed and treated in time, they, many of them we know who are HIV infected, will eventually become ill with their TB. Um, and, and so there is a, a significant amount of TB HIV co infection from this perspective when you're testing HIV infected persons for TB infection. So we have currently a setup. Uh, in our province that so far the numbers look okay, but the likelihood of explosive increases in certain northern high incidence TB communities uh, of HIV TB co-infections, the likelihood of explosive increases in both is excessively high at the moment, in my opinion. And really, uh, obviously, close surveillance is, is needed. We need to keep a close eye on the data. We need to keep working hard uh, in the healthcare sector, knowing that access to healthcare is still inadequate to poor in northern communities, uh, but we know that even limited access to care can lead to 10 to 15 percent declines in tuberculosis per year in northern communities. What will it take to reach pre-elimination target of less than one per 100,000 in 2035? It will take a 40 percent annual decrease of TB in northern communities. So 10 to 15 percent sounds nice and is in the right direction, but is still not close to where we need to be to reach TB pre-elimination in 2035. And so until we also address the social determinants of uh, health, we're not going to beat TB. We're not going to see TB elimination. Um, and at the same time, HIV is going to definitely throw a wrench into that because more HIV TB co-infection is only going to facilitate more uh, transmission of, of TB and higher death rates. So on that somber note, I will, in, um, I guess, end, and we'll be, be switching directly to our next presenter, and I hope this segues nicely into the next uh, presentation.